We will get started with our next panel. I'm going to try really hard not to run as far ahead of schedule as we did this morning, but uh, we're just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. So uh, I'd like to welcome our first panel of the day, and I will introduce Jorge, and I'll let him introduce everybody else. So take it away. Is it working? Yeah, now it is. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for being here. We are thrilled uh, because we're going to be talking about a topic that is, I guess, the bread and butter of platform engineering. Because we've heard some very inspiring talks on how to build your platforms or approaches or specific technologies. But we're gonna, what we're going to discuss today is really the, the difficult choice of what do you actually do? Because you're not going to build out your entire platform. You're most likely going to have pieces that you buy from vendors. You are going to build other pieces. And then you're also, of course, going to adopt open source. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Um, so I am Jorge Lenfiesta. I am the author of the Linux Foundation Introduction to Backstage course. I've been, well, I was working with Backstage for over three years. Uh, so that means I've been very close to the platform side of things. And um, now I'm working at Rootly, which is an incident manager. So it's slightly more tangential, but I'm still very interested in the, in the area. And today with me, we have a fantastic lineup representing different industries from finance to startups. So it's going to be a treat today for the discussion. So uh, let's start uh, with some introductions. Jinghua. Hello, everyone. My name is Jinghua Bainhot. I'm from Saxo Bank. Saxo Bank is an investment, investment bank offers online trading platform. I work as a chief cloud architect, and I'm leading a few platform engineering teams. So I look very much forward to the discussion today with everyone here. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Edgar Espeto Rajas. Uh, I'm working at the Lego Group, this type company probably you all know. Um, I'm a, an engineer. I work with uh, Kubernetes platforms before. Now I'm working with API management and focusing on ev event streaming platforms. And uh, yeah, this subject is really, really hot topic right now. I uh, had worked with different vendors and open source platforms, so really hope to share my experience with you. Hello, I'm Lena Munaram, and I'm a platform engineer at Chainalysis. And Chainalysis are a data platform for the blockchain. And really what I do on a daily basis is try and make our engineers' lives as easy and hopefully as stream as possible. Hello, my name is Victor Araujo. I work as an engineer in the developer experience team at Walt. Walt is a le leading uh, delivery service for food and more. We're present in 27 countries, and we're part of DoorDash International. I have worked for over six years with uh, Kubernetes and different platform and infrastructure teams. And uh, I'm excited to be here discussing this. Thank you. All right, thank you for being here today. And um, we're going to have a little bit of a baseline of a question, because as you know, Platform, even though we have a fantastic paper, uh, white paper from the working group on what platforms are and capabilities, it is still very much varies what a platform means for me. Uh, and in my context, in my company, and in my industry. So we're going to start with a little roundup on what does platform engineering mean to you, or what actually is your platform, you know, in the one that you're working, so we have more context for the follow-up discussion that we're going to have. So who wants to start? I can quickly start. Um, a platform for us is a place where you can get your service. So it's like a, um, a catalog where you can get, I don't know, for example, a database or access to the database and everything around it. Um, we need to make it painless. There's no need for Amazon, Azure, or Google offering such great API, and you still need to go through ticketing system, fill out all the specification in order to get your platform uh, component. So platform to us is a catalog where everyone can order things easily. Um, it might not be as customizable like you have on the combination, but you will have all the best practices and security measures, and compliance requirement building. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll just, uh, I couldn't agree more with Jing Hong on this one. Uh, I think the key word for us is, of course, the cognitive load. Uh, what we're trying to do is reduce the cognitive load. We're not, uh, our primary business is not uh, working with, uh, let's say, IT, but uh, still we have 
many, many developers who would like to focus on innovation and you know working on things that they really care about. And uh, with the years, we see what's happening that there's more and more different cloud providers, platforms to learn. I think I'm making jokes now, like how many CLI tools any of us need to know by this point, right? So uh, I think it's really important that we uh, make sure that developers are happy and that they work on things that they really care about. Absolutely. Again, I agree. Um, and I think if you go back to, to the word, it's platform. And I think the whole idea is that it should be there to support engineers and to be that platform that our engineers can use to build, um, build their software kind of easily, really. And it is, you know, to reiterate, it is about trying to make the right thing for the organization the easiest thing to do and how we can help do that as painlessly as possible. As an engineer, I used to think of a platform in terms of the technology and the teams that I was thrown in. Often in many organizations, there is a single platform team. But what really broadened my horizons is to learn about the product and business side of platform models where you connect uh, service producers were with service consumers, and then that transform, transform the way I think about platforms. And uh, how I understand it now is that we are facilitators to uh, connect these uh, service providers. It could be internally. And when you have this mindset, it also allows you to scale in your organization from having a single team to having a team that is enabling teams that will come and take ownership over a specific uh, areas um, that you want to provide to fulfill your um, organizational mission with technology. So I, that's what I would uh, really like to um, encourage developers to also learn about this product and business side of the business uh, platform model. Yeah, absolutely. I think everybody mentioned like these key uh, cornerstones of platforms and why we are even talking about this concept. We have uh, the distribution of ownership, we have ease of use, we have enablement for developers, and then a very important part that might be driving this entire thing is the business value that we can uh, push through while enabling everyone to work. Uh, and of course, this is a very difficult endeavor, as you have experienced in your own flesh, uh, and that also requires a lot of coordination and collaboration. So how do you go about building a platform in practical terms? How do you identify what you have to build or what you have to just shop around for something that's already built or when you can adopt something on the open source and make it your own? Like, What's your initial step when you are like confronted with this blank page? There is no platform and we want to get somewhere. How do you start? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, Yes, as you mentioned, there are so many products out there. We can, we can build ourselves, we can adopt, or we can buy off on the shelf. Um, I think many companies probably face similar thing, like just compare how much effort is to engineering these components compared to how much does it cost to buy it. But for us, we take both into account, but we're also thinking about the operational cost. So when you buy something, does it mean that you, it just works forever? No, you still need to maintain it, you need to upgrade it, you need to customize it, there's so much to it. So we focus a lot of on customization and scalability. When this makes sense, we, we can buy things, but if it's an open source product which has a great community support, good documentation, we also don't hesitate to, just to adopt it. I think uh, the first step is to go to the drawing board and think about what you want to achieve with your platform in your organization because the business will be investing a lot of money and your engineers will be putting their sweat, blood and tears to uh, make this happen. So um, uh, some common goals might be uh, velocity, developer satisfaction, uh, it could be that uh, this velocity will give you an edge in your business. It could be uh, security, reliability, many things. But I think the first step is to think what you need to achieve and why this investment is going to be justified in the end. I think absolutely. Um, but I think also to kind of keep in mind that the platform isn't necessarily just one product. 
and it isn't necessarily something that you will need to adopt. It could be, you know, you, most organizations already have any number of tools that are being used by, uh, by our engineering. Um, or engineering teams and it's like how can we perhaps streamline those processes and look at the friction already within um, the existing platform or the existing tool set and try and make that perhaps a more cohesive whole and absolutely as Victor said is if you have um, the um, your end goal or your end destination in mind of what you would like it to be that certainly helps and it's something that's been mentioned in a number of the talks today that whole platform as a product approach and it is about having a roadmap and engaging with um, your end customers which are our engineers as to where we want to go in the direction that we want to take platform in I think those are really great points. Um, if I could just summarize what it meant for us uh, and what it means for me is like, is the supply and the demand, right? The supply is the engineering muscle that you have around you that you can have access to. And then the demand is, of course, those who will use the platform. And I think when you choose is the gap that you need to bridge, right? So like if you can build everything yourself, that's awesome. And you can maintain yourself. Most likely that's not going to be the case in most of the times, but uh, if that, that's the ideal scenario, right? But if you cannot do that, then that's where you kind of start shopping around and see what is there in open source, what is there in closed source, and so on. Uh, and I really like that you mentioned maintenance, right? Because building something new and shiny, it's really, it's really great, and uh, it's not that hard usually. Um, it's really the maintenance and like those years, uh, long, long years, uh, where the platform needs to survive and evolve, is that where I really see the biggest challenges. And that's actually really ties into the uh, open source and the vendor, that journey that the product goes. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, <laughs> So there is this concept that you mentioned that is kind of invalidating uh, my question, which is great. Uh, that there, and, and it kind of came out in different questions on how there is no tabula rasa, like there is no like a, an empty state when we start building a platform. There's already prior art. There's things that we are using that we, it's, they are just there. So then when you build a platform, you actually have to take into account what is available and what people are working with before you can start like shaking things up. Uh, even if you just you have a clear goal of where you want to get, that adoption path is gonna require some, some effort, more than even greater than the technical side. So um, let's then take them like case by case, uh, because that, that way we can get some more insight on how you think about these problems. But uh, you mentioned, uh, Dinkon, that if you can find something that it's like ready to buy and that can be useful to you. You can just buy it because it's like a, a no-brainer that you wouldn't want to invest engineering time on building something that's already fitting your, your purposes. So I would like to know more about what kind of criteria would make that kind of ideal uh, bend or ideal option for, for your platform when you decide, oh, I have to buy these components. If there's something where the vendor does will take us years of engineering to achieve that is something we will buy. And to buy, to, to in order to invest on something, like Ed mentioned, you need to know what you want first. So list out and the, the requirements, what, what, what's must have, what's nice to have, et cetera. And then you, you can start really considering, is this something we can build ourselves? And there anything we can adopt? Maybe there's something off on the shelf, and they're already miles away than everyone else. So there's no need, absolutely no need to try to mimic the behavior. And not to mention about the, the maintenance and the further bug fixes, enhancement, etc. It's going to cost a fortune. So yes, if some, something someone else does much better than us, adopt it. Then you already start, start um, accelerate your own development. You can use it to, I don't know, better serve your users. Like if someone does tracing so much better than yours, why would you spend so much engineering hours to write a tracing program? It just doesn't make sense. No. Maybe, uh, and, and I absolutely agree. Like if you can buy something off the shelf, that's great. But just 
maybe just put a little bit of spice into the discussion is like the vendor lock-in, right? Is like the, the thing that we all know. And, and I think uh, it's, it's, it's unavoidable, right? Most of the times you probably end up in some fashion in it. But I think one thing that I personally, this is purely my opinion, what I would be looking out for is, is there a monopoly? in that field, right? So if, if some vendor or someone is actually monopolizing it, there's a higher chance that the terms and conditions will change throughout the time, right? So that's something to be careful. It's much better to be in a space which is, you know, kind of full of competition and, you know, innovation and everybody's just trying to do better. I think that's much safer. I feel much more calm getting into that um, as opposed to like you enter some really niche area and then you have like really specific uh, vendors kind of taking over. So, so that's what I would be kind of careful about. Maybe I can share two standards that we follow in Saxo Bank when we buy something. So there is uh, definitely uh, open standards. So the vendor has to follow open standards. It will enable us to switch later. Another thing is data portability you should be able to control your own data. If your data is elsewhere, you are already starting at the wrong path. So take control of your data, make sure you can get it out later. I think chain analysis are a little bit smaller than Saxo Bank <laughs> and Lego. So for us, I mean, cost comes into the equation and is certainly something that we would look at and would feed into the evaluation process. But along with our platform team, is, you know, we're with seven engineers, so we have to look at the skill set that we have within our engineering team, but also our appetite. Do we want, you know, if we're adopting a particular you know, kind of tool, a particular technology, what does that demand on our skill set and our kind of engineers look like for Absolutely. the next few years? And so those are all things, as a much smaller team, I think we have to also take into account. I've seen organizations of all sizes, even big financial organizations, uh, at a later point regretting buying because it can just become so expensive. For example, observability is something that is very necessary, but uh, many of you might have uh, uh, faced this situation that the bills can really add up quickly. And even if it's, it's an issue even for big organizations, I, I think it's uh, something to always consider. And as platform engineers, um, we should try to leverage the standards provided by the community. So if there is ever the need to roll back a decision, we can, um, are not locked into to a specific vendor. I, I think that's something. Yeah, a, a, a lesson learned uh, the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an absolutely good point uh, that it's been mentioned uh, of the vendor lock-in, that it's a very big risk. And as you mentioned, it can be contractual. It can be because the technology might be out phased, and then we have to migrate to something else, or the vendor disappears, or is acquired, and it tries to buy or sell us different licenses, which is not taken from real life recently. Uh, but um, yes, it's a risk. So then another option is to go for standards or open source uh, uh, technologies or, or projects that are available. However, as, as we have seen, open source is also not the miraculous cure. It usually requires effort to set up. And it also is quite shifting because it's supported by companies. And these companies may like, like close shop or they might just switch their priorities. So that is just, it's not an entire guarantee that the open source is going to keep us going for the many years that we have this platform to run. So, so how do you assess open source options when you are going to say, like, oh, this is, exists in the open source space? How do I say, oh, I'm going to choose this project over the other? Or yeah, how do you go about that? GitHub stars. <laughs> well, well, first thing that I, that I maybe look and who is behind it, trying to see that uh, it has a roadmap ahead. Uh, it's going to be supported. Um, what else? Do you no, think? I agree. I mean, I would look at the activity within the community. You know how you know how fast it's developing. What the contributions look like. Um, but also, I would hope if it's something that we're going to be putting into our production environments um, for our engineers, I would look for a certain level of maturity and stability um, with the tool. 
So generally, it's it's unlikely to be. Um, you know, we might kind of experiment with a kind of newer projects, but it would take a lot for us to kind of push that out and roll that out on a wider basis. Yeah, and uh, I totally agree that uh, you know open source projects will not survive just purely on a goodwill. So most likely, there's going to be some companies kind of contributing, and maybe will be the primary contributors. And that's where another kind of you know question mark comes in. Like, okay, how is that future of that open source project look like? Right? What what is really kind of how is going to look like in five years and so on? And there's another risk that I would be always taking into account, right? Um, because there's a high probability that that's maybe going to become closed source, right? We've seen that uh, times and times again, right? I don't want to jump into another subject, but it's already kind of prefacing that. So um, it, it's really hard, I would say. It's really hard because ideally you would want this really sunshine scenario where everybody's just contributing and every, everything's open source. That's not really sustainable. And then on the other hand, you have like maybe uh, enterprises will just take it over and it's going to be not really an open source anymore. So striking that balance is really, really hard. I don't have like a you know, silver bullet for it, but it's just something that when you assess, you really need to kind of look into those both sides. I think we touch upon almost like all in the area, active uh, community and they need to have a roadmap, maybe also good documentation, etc. cetera. Um, we also look at who, yeah, who's behind, who, who are the big players behind the open source projects. Um, I actually much rather of, from many of our assessment is having big companies behind them. They might influence some of the roadmaps. However, because they are big, so they can support them financially. It's a sustainable way to going forward. Um, and one more thing we'll think about is the license. So, I mean, we have heard enough about uh, open tofu, open bao, etc. I'm glad all the Chinese cuisine got, got pushed forward to the world. <laughs> However, <laughs> I hope you, they, they get introduced in different contexts than, than this, in than this one. So, we. We feel much safer if it's CNCF project. We know that uh, there is environment for it to grow and uh, to, to navigate the government. So I think, yeah, there, there are many things we should consider before adopting any open source projects. And one more thing is maybe um, you have to think if you ever need to contribute. I, I hope uh, many uh, are considering to contribute also to the community. Uh, you have to think also uh, in terms of uh, the people that will run this internally. Do you have um, enough people that you can source to participate or uh, grow in these teams? Um, if you work only in a specific city, is, are there enough developers that you could hire at, at some point? Uh, you also have these limitations with, uh, with open source projects that you, you need to see how you will maintain it and make sure that you can uh, that you have the in-house expertise or that you can recruit for it if, if you don't yeah that's a very good point as well because um, as it's been mentioned we not only want to adopt this now but we want to make this something that's going to survive for years and that that means that the open source project is going to last and that includes having some kind of sustainability back or somebody who can back it enough uh, for it to develop on its own or so there's many criteria so we are very fortunate that CNCF has a very mature way of uh, making projects go forward and become very stable as we have seen um, and yeah that, that's great and then with that, that sets us already into the conversation of day two operations, which is something that is less talked about because we are, most of us are in day one. But some people have already, are already running the platform and have to maintain it. And that is a big area of interest to me. Like once you, you have your initial setup or, okay, we bought this part, we built this section and we adopted these frameworks, like a year from now, two years from now, how do you run the maintenance of this whole platform so it keeps running uh, in general or if you have to replace something or yeah, how do you go about it? We have rebuilt our platform a few times now. <laughs> 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 and then not to mention how many components were swapped in and out. Um, I see that as a healthy way um, going forward. So nothing stands still. Um, you need to have a capable team. So people come into play here. You need to as organization, you really need to spend 
time and effort to grow your employees. Send them to KubeCon, for example, and send them to various meetup groups to grow them. So your team can constantly get exposed to new way of working, new way of thinking, and new way of development. Um, to keep your components alive. Otherwise, I mean, we don't want to be stale like a mainframe, so we have to. I, I see that as a, a healthy way that uh, keep changing and keep evolving your components, your platform. I think what is also, oh, sorry, uh, what is also really, really important, be it a vendor or be it open source, is being very, very close to the, you know, to the product. Uh, so if it's a vendor, then, for example, I had created hundreds of different tickets with different vendors before. I had uh, very long conversations about different bugs and fixes and you know, feature requests. Because if you don't get involved, you know, that kind of will just take its own way, right? And that maybe will not be the best for your organization or the team or, 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 or so on. And the same goes for open source, right? Like, um, I see often people, you know, like complain about uh, open source products, but we sometimes forget it's like it's, it's, it comes for free, right? So <laughs> be involved, try to contribute, try to be part of the ecosystem, and that's just at least some way to ensure the better future for the platform. Now, when it comes to operations itself, like of course, we have a lot of good practices, and I'm not going to dive deep into that. But, but for the open source and vendor, I would say keep close yourself to the ecosystem. That's super important. Yeah. I think I'm maybe thinking about your question in a slightly different way. So I'm thinking about our platform and how we evolve it and how we look at the tools and what needs to be changed and what needs to be updated. And for, for us at Chainalysis, it's very much about trying to get feedback from our engineers. How are people using it? How are they finding? Um, how easy is it? How, yeah, how easy is it for them to, to actually be able to achieve what they want to achieve? And it may well be that there are certain component parts of our platform that are no longer fit for purpose or that there are other better products that we need to evaluate. And really, that's our job as a platform. We need to continuously strive to try and hopefully keep on top of what technology is available and how we can use it to uh, better support the engineers. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. And there's the, let's call it the health of the consumer side, the developers that are using your platform, and also the health of the uh, producer side, the developers that are uh, running and maintaining your platform. And you have to look at both. Your organization has to take care of both and um, make sure that the teams are well staffed, that you have uh, plans for uh, con continuity, Keep training people. Keep uh, uh, don't depend on a single person. That if they leave, the the project is uh, on a dif difficult situation. Yeah. All this. Yeah, those are all fantastic points. I, and I think it's, it's it just broadens the perspective of even what I was thinking about with this question. Because you you started Ping Pong with the the idea of. It's not wrong. Something didn't go wrong if you have to change your platform. It's normal and it's healthy that you have to replace it, especially in this place that is just emerging. It's natural that in a year from now, we're going to have a better product or a better technology or a better vendor. Or even ourselves, we have learned that this is something that we don't need based on either from the feedback of the users or because it's becoming too hard or too expensive. And, and then we have the perspective of, of having that like relationship with the people that we are providing us with services and I think that's really crucial to be close to your vendor or be close to the open source community that's building the project that you're uh, developing with so that's a really valuable insight and then what you mentioned is getting ahead uh, of the conversation but it's the point that we're going to touch on now of how do you evolve your platform how do you take it because you, you we started the conversation with you saying that you have to have these goals and then we decided to build it. We put something together. We are maintaining it. But it's very unlikely that we are, are going to achieve our goals in the first iteration. We need to make this platform evolve towards something. How do you plan for evolution? How do you make this intentional change over your different components and the sources that they have? Um, yeah. If I must list two most important things, well, we always work towards you. Let's make the platform more accessible and more disaster recovery ready. 
So disaster happens, which we, yeah, we have encountered. <laughs> so how do we bring the platform back up as fast as possible? This is something we constantly work towards too. Second thing is how to make the platform more accessible to uh, our employees, our, our developers. Because in the beginning, you, you focus on functionality. You get the functionality out, so they have this thing they can utilize. But it might not be as pretty. You might, they have, might have to access via CLI or API, etc. You want to make it as simple as possible for everyone. So they don't need to be an expert. They don't need to be a super user in order to use um, your, your functionality uh, provided by the platform. Uh, for me, when we start changing a uh, platform, we try to take a cautious approach, uh, releasing it and testing it with some of our users before um, taking some uh, metrics and then seeing if it's the right way to go. And in that case, uh, be customer-centric, be customer-oriented. The, the way not to do it is to introduce um, these expensive migrations in terms of time where it will take the time of all the teams to change to your new system and create a lot of frustration in the process. That's, that's the way not to do it. If I could add, um, and I'm not the first one to say this, but like, you know, eat your own dog food. So when it comes to the, to the users, right, I had a kind of funny, funny anecdote where, where we were preaching for the spec first approach for the APIs. And then some, one of the users came and said, you know, this API that you have exposed is actually code first. So why are you even preaching that, right? So that was really, really kind of, um, kind of a funny moment. And I think uh, it's really important. So you need to walk the way with your users. You need to put yourself in the shoes of your users. And that journey might you, you might start at here, and then it's going to end up completely different place. And I've seen that time and time again. So I think it's super important. Yeah, eat your own dog food, try your pro products, and also work together with your users. Absolutely. And I'm going to kind of use that buzzword again, or the buzz phrase. Um, the platform is a product, and it's something that we really try and work towards. It's not always easy. We don't have a product owner, um, a product manager for platform. So all of our engineers, all of us have to embody a little bit of product in our interactions with engineers. So it means that we have to talk to engineers, uh, find out what the issues are, and then try and build that into our roadmap for how we want our platform to evolve. And kind of balance that up with um, planned features and planned developments that take the engineering organization forward, so that may well be kind of security guide ra um, guardrails, um, as well as, you know, suggested features from our engineering teams as well. Right. Yeah, you had something? Yeah, I actually had a comment to Victor's migration. <laughs> we just got through a huge migration from um, this pipeline push to approach to GitHub approach. And there was a hell of a migration, <laughs> but it was totally worth it. So if you guys are not GitOps ready, please <laughs> use Flux or, or Argo. Then it will pay off in the longer run. So sometimes migration isn't necessary. Sometimes <laughs> migrations can be good, yeah. yeah. But there are ways as a platform team that you can try and make that an easier process. And it may well be that you know we could invest time to make it you know, a few click buttons rather than a few weeks of hell. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I, yeah, I think that's, uh, I don't know how we're doing with time, but OK. Then thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions. Oh, great. Hello. So you all talked about value and the value the platform will bring to the business. Can you give me some ideas on how you would measure that? And what it means, what value would mean to you? If I, yeah, um, the the typical value is we compare our platform speed, delivery speed to our to ticketing system. So the existing process. Let's say if you want to have a database with access, where you, your whole group need to have access to certain database within certain size, certain spec, how fast can they order via your platform to the traditional? 
um, ticketing system like ServiceNow, et cetera. So if we can prove we can do it faster, I would say net value right there. Dora metrics, for example, you can use Dora metrics uh, to validate that your organization is moving faster and safer. And what else? Um, customer satisfaction, I like uh, net promoter score. You survey people and uh, you have promoters and detractors and then uh, you make a sum there and if it's positive, uh, you're doing good and the higher, the better. Absolutely, I was going to say pretty much what you said. Um, so it's like that mixture of quantitative um, metrics that you can kind of imply or you can work out from the data and um, various you know, pull requests, etc., as well as qualitative information. Um, and I guess the softer side, you know, are how do our engineers feel about the platform? Where do they feel the bottlenecks are? And sometimes that can surface issues that you just can't find with the data. And I, I agree fully with uh, all the points, but I just want to kind of put a little bit that actually measuring is very, very hard. Um, and I'm not going to name the consultancies that were measuring developer productivity recently. I think that really was a hot topic, right? And I actually think I, I tried really hard uh, to measure. I, I worked a lot with observability of our platforms, and I really didn't find a silver bullet. How do you really measure that? So other than concrete cases, right, like somebody did a project this way, and now they did this way, and then they come back to you and say, this is great. I don't disagree, uh, Dora metrics are awesome, uh, but we really, when we look into data, we need to be very careful what we're looking at because there's always this uh, bias that we have in data. Hi, um, uh, so you're sort of running like an um, internal product startup within your orgs. How do you market it and sell it within the orgs? Do you like use the carrot method or do you use a stick method? Maybe share some examples. <laughs> For me, it's literally everything, whatever works. And sometimes it's, it depends on what initiative you're pushing out. Um, you've got to try and use a whole set of tools. And sometimes it is literally, for some projects, you know, I've literally had calls with every single team and invested the time. And actually, I have to explain why they need to make time in their sprints to dedicate to this and why it's important. Um, so lit, yeah, everything. <laughs> I think education is really, really important. We do a lot of training, online training, workshop, etc. It's like you need to write, really run a campaign for, for your setup to, to sell your, your product. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually like that, right? Platform as a product, uh, why is your product better than other products? And I would say we always start with a carrot, right? But then at some point, <laughs> you might need a stick. But to be honest, like communication is the key. Um, I had some experiences before that when you go and really talk with the users, you find out that actually they don't adopt uh, because the platform is, is, is bad or is wrong, but just because their needs were not heard early enough. Um, and then you really need to listen carefully what is exactly blocking them from adopting it. So most of the time it's not going to be because people just don't want to. It's just because it's not making their life easier. And that's really the key why we need platforms, right? When you're introducing something great that is a carrot in itself, I think if you really need a big stick, you have to think why. <laughs> but sometimes uh, it's just the nature of the problem. Sometimes it, it is necessary. In terms of big stick, I would probably translate that as leadership sponsorship. It really helps. Um, I found, you know, if you can get, you know, CTO say, oh, do you know what? This is a really good idea. Suddenly everyone's listening. <laughs> Hi, is there any thought or any requisition from the management in your organizations about how the platforms can make the organization more resource efficient, more sustainable maybe? Uh, I think, so. oh, sorry. Uh, just to understand sustainability, you mean environmental sustainability or? In terms of resource 
consumption. Yes, yes, absolutely. So this is really, really important topic uh, in our organization, and and the efforts are constant. Uh, we really. If we look really from engineering perspective, we actually start measuring like, okay, how much uh, you know resources will use what we run our applications. We we uh, done some efforts moving to different instance types. We done uh, different uh, investigations, like even programming languages. How much if you run it in this program language and a different one? This is what we as engineers can do. There's much larger efforts around it, but uh, I think all of us can chip in at least a little bit. I can agree more. It, ESG is such an important topic. Thanks for bringing up. Um, we commit to to improve how how can we reduce emission and how can we, uh, for example, just why do we run in, run things in containers? Why do we need Kubernetes uh, to increase the density of an application? We can run in in each server. Um, why do we care about which language we write? It's just because one is more efficient than any other. There are many things engineers can do to improve the environment, improve our CO2 uh, emissions. I think we, everybody needs to keep that in mind and try to build a platform to, to go towards to that. Templating, for example. If you can template the way how you build application, put all the logic in, then people don't need to write everything from scratch. Small things like that can, can go a long way. I think we've got time for one last question. Oh, hello. Um, first of all, um, it, there, there is a big difference between the users of a platform and the users of another kind of products. I mean, the users of a, of a platform also have a technical knowledge. So it is possible to use that knowledge in the, in, into uh, getting a better tool for, 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 for a whole organization. In this sense, an inner source strategy can, be, can come handy. So how do you incentive these kind of strategies? inner source as in um, getting people from the developer teams to build for your oh that's a great question uh, first you have to encourage I, I think openness in your um, organization and you have to make sure that it is easy to contribute to your systems and you have to communicate this as well and uh, I think you can notice people that are interested in, in the technologies when you are interacting with them on your daily work and uh, you can approach them if your organization allows this uh, to Absolutely, and, and it's all saying at Chainalysis, particularly with kind of our platform, is really important given that there are only seven platform engineers um, serving the engineering department or engineering. Uh, and th we do that exactly by kind of encouraging um, contributions to, to the platform and you know as Victor mentioned you know you, you see the same generally the same feature engineers will contribute again and again so we have like you know a, um, you know kind of really keen engineers that, that do want to get involved um, but it is also a little bit as we mentioned earlier about uh, making our repositories and our the platform as accessible to um, feature engineers, so it does mean you know, if we're saying that everyone has to have a great README and you know great documentation around it, we have to provide that for our repositories in order that it is accessible to allow um, the engineering, the wider engineering um, division to contribute. Okay, but just wanted, I, I agree with uh, all of it, and I would say we also need to champion the inner sourcing. So if somebody, we had cases where somebody has, hey, I have implemented this tool for your platform, and we don't just ignore it while, like, we actually bring it up and say, hey, look at this. This is really awesome. Like, everybody, come on, let's do it, right? So I think it's also important to just promote each other's work and not be too selfish, right? I think we all care about our work the most, but I think it's also important that we're, we promote actually each other's work as well. All right. Thank you so much. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.